Hey everybody, check it out. You can answer the call of Jesus and be a media missionary by giving us a like, subscribe, a follow, and share the word of God. Okay? Enjoy the message. God, you keep me in perfect peace. Uh, you know, the, the important thing as believers is, well, one of many important things I must say is to always be praying. Uh, Philippians 4, 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I really like what Paul says here in, in verse 8 to 9. He says, Finally, brethren, I love, I love these, these parts so much. I can't emphasize uh, how much. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on those things. But um, prayer is, is one of our most important, important tools in the arsenal that the Lord has given us. We can, like Pastor Aileen said, go boldly before the throne of God's grace with any of our requests. Uh, be covered in his peace, uh, but also he hears us. And uh, he has favor over us, and he has favor over Israel, and we are for Israel. We are a people who are for Israel. Um, that all being said, I just, I just like that Pastor Aileen took us into a time of prayer. Hmm. Can I pray one more time? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Holy Spirit, I... I it was really beautiful to see your glory come over the room, like your presence, Lord. That's something that we need every day is a touch from you. And as we divide your word today, Lord, uh, we pray that you would just teach us something that we can hold on to for life, Lord, for eternity, Lord. Something that, uh, like Rochelle said, we can go out from here and share with another another believer, Lord, or a non-believer. Um, that's an important aspect of our relationship with you, of our service to you, Lord. So we love you. We praise you. Uh, Holy Spirit, you be the teacher. And in your name we pray. Amen. Online church, if you didn't know, if you did not know, every fourth Wednesday of the month is Meet, greet, and eat. Meet, greet, and eat. I think I'm finally saying it correctly, okay, in the right order. Uh, that means come out, visit us here in person in Huntington Beach on the fourth Wednesday of the night and get a free meal, free dinner, and a free, a free meal, spiritual meal of the Word of God, okay? Come fellowship with us. We want to meet you. We want to see you. We haven't seen you in a while, so please come out. <laughs> no. <laughs> we might not have meat. No. No, uh. <laughs> One of these days we'll get the, some patties and do barbecue burgers or something outside. Yes, when the summer comes. Um, but let's get into the, to the Word of God because I promised Rochelle that. Well, I told Rochelle that I was going to try and get us out of here by 8 o'clock, and that is clearly not going to happen. So, <laughs> uh, like any other time that I get the opportunity to come up here and teach, I have a couple questions. Uh, I, I like to personally uh, prod my own heart with questions because it puts me in a mindset of, well, how is the Lord going to answer this particular problem? You know, I don't have to wonder how the problem is going to be solved. I just get to speculate on what good thing the Lord is going to do to fix it, you know. So uh, if, go out on, on an adventure with me in your mind right now. If I told you to walk in a dark room, pitch black room, and I said, find it, 
would you be able to find it? Find what? That's a very, very, very important question. You see, find it in a dark room proves to be a very difficult task. <clears throat> the reason being is we're missing one of my most favorite words about studying the Bible. Daniel, what do you think it is? Context. We're missing context. If I tell you to walk into a dark room and find it with no context, you might as well turn around and look at me and say, I'll never do it. The likelihood of you figuring out what I'm talking about is slim to nothing. Slim to nothing. I left out vital information that would help you get to the right place and find what exactly you're looking for. Are you looking for a tool? Are you looking for a switch? Are you looking for an item? Maybe something of great value? It kind of begs a similar question. You know, we're believers. We have knowledge. We have the Holy Spirit. But what if I went out into the world and told the world, go and find heaven? How would the world find heaven? I think that there'd be a whole lot of speculation on how it could be done. There's not a single doubt in my mind that if you ask people, how do you get to heaven? Some of them say, well, be a good person. Brandon and I were learning earlier about certain groups of people that don't believe there even is a heaven at all. So how can someone who is in the world, who does not have a relationship with God, grasp the clear, true concept of getting to heaven? It's like sending someone into a dark room and saying, find it. You see, the problem with the world is they are all looking for something for purpose, for satisfaction, in a dark world with no instructions on how to find what they're looking for or what they might even be looking for. You see, without God, Solomon would say that life is vain or meaningless. People outside they are absolutely looking for purpose. That's why some people protest. That's why some people become great business leaders, work hard. They're looking for satisfaction for their souls. I'm always fascinated with those kind of, uh, I don't want to say this and be offensive, but I don't know, I guess there's no really offensive way to say this. Those, those gentlemen that have just lived full lives and they've seen the whole world and, and uh, they live kind of carefree. I've met one or two of them in my lives, in my life, in my life. They're looking for satisfaction. <clears throat> the problem is, is that the things of the world will not give you a good purpose and the things of the world can never satisfy the soul. We, we as believers, know that what their hearts are truly looking for is Jesus. He is the only one that can satisfy the soul. He is the only one that can make you feel fulfilled, 
validated, truly loved, and give you your true purpose and your identity. We just talked about that in worship, right? John 1, 12. That's, that's the heavy hitter of the last couple months for me. John 1, 12. Write that in your Bibles if you guys uh, don't know that one by heart. Memorize it, please. Let's, uh, let's listen to what John says in John 8, 12. Jesus said to them, then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. You see, uh, believer or non-believers, people who are not Christians, who do not know God are out there. They are looking for purpose. They are looking for satisfaction for their soul in a dark room. And they don't know what they're looking for. But Jesus is that light in a dark room. We've been studying in our connect group, the book of Micah. And what a dark time that was. We have, and I know I, I've said this like three times, but context is so important when we're studying the Bible. We have seen kings in Micah's time deny God, deny his power, bring his altar down out of his temple and replace it with a pagan altar. We've seen them sacrifice their kids in fire. We've seen them be corrupt, abusive towards the people. We had Ahaz had a personal visit from the prophet Isaiah and blew him off. You know, I kind of wonder, though, at some point, if we had seen Isaiah in, in, that, in our particular time, like right now, would we have, not that we wouldn't believe God, but would we have taken him that seriously? That's a, that's a, I think that's a legitimate question to ask. The whole Israelite world in Jerusalem, in Judah, and in Israel is filled to the brim with chaos. Absolute chaos. They are walking in moral darkness. Just like our culture here in the United States is today walking in moral darkness. We are murdering children, not us personally, but our people are. We are condoning terrorism. I don't like to be political, but I will call it what it is. That's what's happening. We are giving up our identities and trading them in for false identities. Our world is in a dark place, and it needs Jesus the same way that the people in the book of Micah needed Jesus. You see, there's nothing new under the sun. It seems as though having a strong conviction about living a moral life is just as difficult for people now as it was then. Why? Why do we, as a people struggle so hard with wanting to be holy, with wanting to be pleasing to God, with wanting to be connected to God. Why do we struggle from that, with that? <laughs> uh, I like that uh, old hymn, Come Thou Fount. Have any of us ever heard that old hymn? Come thou fount of every blessing, tune thy heart to sing thy praise. There's a really uh, beautiful section of lyrics in there that I love, and he says, Take my heart, Lord, come and seal it, bind my wandering heart to thee. 
even that man, I wish I, I need to go find his name. I, I need to do some research on this hymn. He knew, knew my heart wanders, and I need God to be the one that bonds my heart to him. Let your grace down like a fetter. A fetter, uh, by the way, is a, it's a, it's a binding tool. It's a, it's a binder. Uh, bind my wandering heart to thee. Well, how do you see in the dark? How do, <laughs> night vision goggles, a light, flashlight. You don't. You don't even try sometimes. But how do we as believers, how do we see in a morally dark world? How do, how do we do that? How do we... <laughs> <laughs> the flashlight, yeah. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, Matt picked up his Bible and used it like a flashlight. Perfect. Uh, I've heard the acronym over all the years of being a Christian for the word Bible. <laughs> yes, Rochelle, you're so awesome. <laughs> the Bible stands for Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Don't give me any credit. I didn't come up with that. I've been hearing that for years. I don't know who did, but I was like, man, that's so, that's awesome. You know what's really cool about it too is the first time I heard about it, I was at the castle and Teen Challenge and you know that, that whole vibe there is like, yeah, I'm in like Christian boot camp. Like you really take on that like I'm, I'm the army of God type mentality. And so you're like, I'm looking for my basic instructions, you know. Well, if we want to see, if we want to see in this dark, corrupt, morally corrupt world, we need to have basic instructions before we leave the earth. And we can, what's that? And you need to read them because it's no good having a book laying on the backseat of your car for a year that you never read. This is a personal testimony. <laughs> Read a year later, and you're like, why didn't I read this way sooner? Uh, so for the online church who, who can't hear is Rochelle's talking about buying something from the store that you have to build yourself and you don't read the instructions and have to go back. The most humbling experience is when you have to go back into the trash and pull the instructions out. Yeah, I don't need these. <laughs> yeah, you throw the, the cooking instructions away in the trash and you have to go back and check. Yeah, that's the worst. You gotta wash your hands like eight times because you, for some reason, don't stop throwing it away every time you read a step. <clears throat> you see, we can find light in dark places in the Bible. It can be our map, it can be our refuge, our instruction on how to stay holy and pleasing to God in a dark, morally corrupt world. And listen, this is the important responsibility for a believer. The most important responsibility for every Christian, the Bible tells us how to be a light for those looking around and stumbling in the darkness. Now listen, let's hear a little snapshot of how morally corrupt and dark the, the, the citizens of Judah were in Micah chapter 6. This is the word of the Lord. He says, Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint, and you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. I know that for the Connect group, this is like the third time we've studied this. But, man, there's so much to pull out of this, these sections of Scripture here. There's just a lot. Verse 3, O oh my people, what have I done to you, and how have I wearied you? Testify against me. Uh, we, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Like, 
the Lord is, is challenging them. Come on, tell me, what did I do to you that you would treat me in the way that you are treating me? Verse 4, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I sent you before you, I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Miriam was Moses' sister. Mar Moses is Aaron's sister. How many times can I say Moses is in a row? And brother, yes, I, for those of you who didn't know, verse 5, Oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled. Remember, this is the guy that was trying to uh, hire Balaam to curse Israel. And what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Acacia Grove to Gigal, Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. Verse 6, with what shall I come before the Lord, and how shall I bow myself before the high God. Listen, shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Shall I come before him with sacrifices? Shall I come before him with uh, beautiful worship songs? With calves a year old? Shall I come with him, before him with massive amounts of money for a tithe? Will the Lord be pleased with 10,000 rams 10,000 rivers of oil shall I give my firstborn. We saw one king do that. Uh, no, it's okay. For, for my transgression. Shall I come before him with my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? That is the word of the Lord. What do we find here in this particular section of Scripture? We find us a group of people doing what they would have considered good things. They would have considered these doing good things. We consider tithing a good thing, right? We consider beautiful worship songs good things, right? Are they bad things? By no means. They're not bad things. But there's a very important aspect that's being missed here. Maybe the mentality was, if I do enough good things, then maybe this is and this is more a menta mentality of today's culture. If I do enough good things, then maybe the universe will be good to me. Have, have we been hearing that a lot in, in our culture? Like, oh, that's just the universe trying to tell me that uh, I shouldn't go that direction. Or the universe is just not letting that happen, you know, nowadays. And what does that even mean? <sighs> and I'm not trying to be, yeah. I'm not trying to be a, a mockery because I think that, you know what this person that's, that's talking about the universe has that, that the atheist doesn't? They were at least looking for something spiritual and I'm praying that they find it in Jesus. They're, they're on their way. Yep. Listen, this is the important aspect though. Can good works get me to heaven? Can offering bulls and oil and incense and rams and all those things, can those things get me to heaven? If I placed good and bad works on the scale, which way would they tip? Can, can we determine that? Listen, you would, like logically you would think that the scale would tip in whichever direction there's more of, right? I did more good things, so good outweighs the bad. Or I did more bad things, so bad outweighs the good. Like, logically, we, we can come to that conclusion. But we're lacking an intimate aspect of the knowledge of God in this, in this kind of thinking. I've heard it said on several occasions that God on the throne is infinitely holy. 
infinitely holy. You can't even com comprehend his holiness. And so sinning against him is infinitely sinning. One single sin is sinning against an infinitely holy God. And so one good deed, thousands of good deeds, millions of good deeds can never outweigh bad deeds. They just can't. Let's hear what the prophet Isaiah says about good works. I'm sorry that this is really kind of harsh, but this is what the Bible says about this. Uh, Isaiah 64, verses 6 and 7, it says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness, all of our righteousnesses, that's a, that's a tongue twister there, are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, that's talking about God's name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. Isaiah himself says, our good works before God, they're worthless. In comparison to his holiness. You see, because God is holy, no good thing we ever do in the flesh could outweigh or tip the scales in favor for us in regards to the good that we do. We can't. And some might even say, I am a good person, and I'm always wanting to do the right things. I have good intentions. Good intentions. Got good intentions. Listen, uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote in his time, this is like 1000 AD, hell is paved with good intentions. It's like, what am I? When I was a kid, I thought that quote was so cool. And as I got older, I really started to understand. It. I was like, well, that's, that's kind of scary. Hell is paved with good intentions. You see, we, even as believers, see things through a mirror dimly, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. And so our best efforts to make things right, to do good, will always fall short. Fatted calves, sacrifices in the Old Testament, and good works, ties, servings, and kindness, though they may be motivated by good intentions, can never meet the standard God has set before us. And even at that, we don't have the moral compass on our own to rightly divide what are good and what are bad works. Is this a heavy, is this a heavy scripture, section of scripture? It's kind of hard. It's a really, I mean, it's one of those things that is like, it's so easy to understand, but so hard to do. Because the basis of our faith is that it's not about any good thing that we could have ever done in our life. It's that God loved us so much, he shed his blood for us, and that is what gets us access to God. That is what gives us eternal life. But from the time that we're born to the time to this day, however old you are, the way that we are raised is that if we do good things, we will be rewarded for it. And that learning over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years conflicts with the idea of God's grace. So I think that I know me personally as a believer, I have struggled with 
feeling like if I am not doing something good, then I, then I have a problem, an issue with God. And that is not reality. Because my good works, they're irrelevant. And if I have any good works, they're just a fruit of my relationship with God. They're really his good works. They're his good works. Like uh, Ephesians 2 says, that he prepared in advance for us good works because we are his craftsmanship, his, his handiwork. That's a beautiful section of scripture right there. Well then, how do we know how to do good works? How do we turn away from the evil that is found so naturally in our hearts? Basic instructions before leaving earth. Listen to what Jesus says here in John 15, 5. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Wherefore, without me, you can do nothing. That's it. It's that simple. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. You see here in Micah, we have the masses attempting to do things God has asked. Sacrifices, observing feasts, um, temple worship, gathering, uh, observing the Sabbath. All these things they're probably doing and they're attempting to do what God has asked them to do. Whether they have good intentions or selfish ambitions, they're doing these things, but they're still being rebuked by God himself. And why? The heart issue. The lack of connection to God. Listen, on the other hand, basic instructions before leaving earth, God is going to give them very clear instructions on the way he desires them to live in Micah 6, 8. He says, What do I require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Let me kind of just... <laughs> What is, what is justice? I'm going to kind of, kind of take a deviation here because I, I think it's really important that we, we define these words. Uh, <laughs> what's that? Oh, that's okay. Revenge. Revenge. Okay. Revenge is an excellent example of justice. But vengeance is for the Lord and not for us. Yes. Unfortunately, that isn't, well... Let's just talk about what is justice. We're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to have our hearts in positions where we're loving to see righteousness, right? We're loving. Who likes a good judge? Who likes a corrupt judge? No, Anybody in this room like a corrupt judge? We love justice. To love mercy. And this isn't talking about I love when mercy is given to me, okay? To love mercy in the way that I am so quick to be merciful with everyone around me. When uh, people cut me off on the freeway, just usually assume that they have to use the restroom, and that's, that's my way of connecting with mercy there. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> It softens my heart towards them. But what if someone steals from you? What if somebody hurts you emotionally or physically? We as believers, what God is calling them to and calling us to is to be in a position where we are quick to be merciful. That doesn't mean forget and immediately trust. But Jesus made it clear, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. And to walk humbly with your God. Humility. That's one thing we hate. 
We don't like humility very much, do we? It requires more of us than sometimes we'd like to give. Uh, is it Jimmy Elliott? Is that his name? Yeah, Jimmy Elliott. Uh, I, I heard him quoted saying, uh, humility is not thinking less of yourself. You're not thinking less of yourself, but you're thinking of yourself less. So we're not talking about the kind of false humility. Oh, I, I'm nothing. I'm, I'm weak. And well, we're all weak, but you guys get what I'm saying. We're, we're talking about I'm putting my brother's and sister's needs before my, my own needs. I'm going to take care of everybody else. That's, that's humility. I'm going to walk humbly with your God. I'm going to take care of my relationship with God before I worry about anything else. You know, uh, my, my, my former boss, Tim Sook, he once taught this really beautiful message about being successful in, in, in ministry. And he brought it back to this point. Uh, your first ministry is your relationship with God. Your only ministry is your relationship with God. Every other ministry is his ministry. So be faithful to yours, and he'll take care of the rest. Walk humbly with him. There's one thing going on here. In order for them to know what justice, mercy, and humility are, though, they need to have a crucial functioning function happening in their hearts. And that takes us back to John 15, 5 where Jesus says, uh, can, we, can we backtrack that one real quick because I kind of veered off to the left a little bit. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing. See, here in Micah 6, what we're seeing is that the Israelites, the, you say Judites? Is that how you would say that? Judites? the Hebrews, they were missing the connection to God. They need God to be the one that points their moral compass in the right direction. We need God to be the one that points our moral compasses in the right direction. Otherwise, we'll be going left, right, sideways, backwards, down, up, moving in directions that we can't even comprehend. We need God to be the one that points our moral compass in the right direction to help us find what we are looking for in dark times. We need to be the light that points people of the world to Jesus to find what they're looking for in a morally corrupt, dark world to find salvation from their sins. Listen, this is a important thing. Uh, you see, apart from God, we can do no good. And that is a little bit of a tough pill to swallow. It's like trying to swallow those thousand milligram of vitamin C from Costco. This thing's terrible. But it's the truth. No good can come from having good intentions, all things come from God. All things that are good come from God, just like James 1.17 says. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So, if we are going to, or if we are looking to live holy, pleasing lives before the Lord, here are the things that we need. Okay, and also lives that point towards Jesus, because we got to be the light, the salt and the light in a dark world. Okay, first and foremost, we need connection to God. That's the most important part. How do I get connected with God? You got to pray, read, and obey, like like Ron Strong would say. 
Uh, my friend Greg Hunt, he would, he would say this. He would say, if you read the Bible and you don't pray, then you'll become a legalist. And if you pray but you don't read your Bible, you'll become a mystic. So you need the both to be really connected with God. Okay. First and most important part of living holy, pleasing lives before the Lord, connection to God. Pray, read, okay? And obey. That's, that's the hard one, obey. You know, you hear that, that, that prompting from the Holy Spirit that says, don't go there. And then you kind of like, well, that's the worst that could happen. That's <laughs> I'll post this meme, and if I can find it in the Discord later, of uh, it's a meme of like a hyena walking away all limping, and its hairs all over the place, and it says me when I try to operate outside the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'll post it in the Discord later. Um, second, second thing. Uh, secondly, a right moral compass. That's the second thing that we need, and that can only come from God, and that comes from connection with God. Walk humbly, do justly, love mercy, love God, and love others. That's your right moral compass right there, right? Uh, you see, the Israelites, when they entered the promised land, they were given a right moral comp compass. It, it consisted of 10 commandments and about 618 laws, right? We get the easy part because Jesus summed it all up for us in these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Listen to this this thing though, because even as I, I still think about this, there's a reason that it says love God, then love your neighbor. Because God needs to be your first ministry. There's nothing more important than that. You know, relationships in the world are really important. Pastor Paul sat me down one day, and he says, Daniel, uh, relationships are like cake. He says, if relationships were like cake, Jesus would be the bread and people would be the icing. You can't have the cake without the bread. You can have the cake without the icing, but the icing complements the bread. Okay, and then lastly, uh, the last part that we need to live a holy, pleasing life before the Lord uh, to know God's instructions for us by reading and dividing his word. We can never live a perfect or pleasing life on our own. And see, the good thing for us is that Jesus did step in for us. Right? That's, that's the good thing. As, as sinful as we are, knowing that every sin is just an automatic like death sentence Jesus laid his life down for us because just as man sinned man had to pay the price so he died in our place but listen we can bear the fruit of a new creation of a disciple love, joy faithfulness, goodness love, joy, peace, faithfulness Love, joy, peace, patience, faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, kindness, and self-control. Good works that come out as fruit. Really, God's good works. And we do these things by connection to Jesus, through the study of the word, and through prayer, so that we can live a holy, pleasing life before God. Let's uh, read one last scripture, and then we'll pray. Uh, Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you for the opportunity to divide these scriptures, Lord, uh, to study them. And Lord, <laughs> justice, mercy, and humility are things that we can all continually grow in as each day passes, Lord. We want to be connected with you, Lord. We want to do the good work that you prepared in advance for us, Lord. We want to be light in a dark world. 
We want to be able to point to you in this dark world, Lord. We pray that our, our people would repent of the terrible things that they are doing, Lord, as we continually repent for every time our hearts stray away from you, Lord. You've been so good and kind to us, Jesus. Teach us, correct us, Lord, guide us, bring us into your fold, Lord. Keep us connected to the vine, Lord. Help us to love you because you first love us, Lord. And let that love pour out on everybody else around us. We love you and praise you, Jesus. And in your name we pray, amen. Good night, guys.